um, we kind of ran, ran out. So hopefully we'll have the, the you know, upcoming presentations on our website. So you can go to the website and um, find out what the upcoming sessions are. Or if you'd like to email me, um, you can, I can send you all that information as well. Uh, I apologize that we ran out on the posters and the, and the flyers as well. Um, I just talked a little bit about some of the sessions that's coming up this semester. We have two on videos. Um, this is our first one today. Michael's going to be talking about YouTube. The second one is in February, where we're going to look at a series of videos um, um, used by different instructors in their courses. And we're going to have a fun session. We're going to have popcorn and candy. And I think it'll be fun. Um, the third one, which is in March, is going to be on um, automated learning and gating on K-State Online. So if you're interested, please do come. Gating is a new feature that it's in K-State Online that we'd like to demonstrate and show how you can use that in your courses or in, you know, in, in any way you'd like. It doesn't have to be used in a course. Um, the last one, which is going to be in April, will be on deploying teaching case studies in e-learning. And that will be by Shaolin Haiju. Um, so those are the four sessions that are lined up for this spring semester. And today we have Michael Wesch from Anthropology. He will be presenting to you on YouTube. And now, many of you know he's been using YouTube for over a year now. And um, he's been using it a lot in his teaching and also in his courses. He's created a video called Web 2.0, The Machine is Using Us, or using, yeah, using us or using, using as us, yeah, he, it, it's really complicated because he's taken two words, broken it down, added more words. So, but he's won an award for that. I mean, he's won several awards actually. Um, he's, his video has won an award in the Wired magazine as the Rave Award, um, and the John Culkin Award for Outstanding Media Praxis from the Media Ecology Association. He also did a project with the Chronicle of Higher Education on studying video blogging. So Michael has been featured on the PC World. 49 ABC News, and we are honored to have him present for us today. So without further ado, please let's welcome Michael Wesch. Right, so I just found out that YouTube can penetrate the classroom in all kinds of ways that might surprise you. Um, so just this morning, I uh, was giving one of my first lectures. I teach in anthropology. I study in Papua New Guinea. and so. When I, during the first week, I try to give my students a sense of like what it's like to be in Papua New Guinea. So I take them on this virtual fieldwork experience, and that involves all sorts of props, which means you know we have to get dressed up and wear like the native garb and that kind of thing. And I wasn't actually wearing this exactly, but you know <laughs> I was doing a certain demonstration on top of the table, and I look out and I see the cell phone recording me, <laughs> and you know where that's going. So so we'll look for that later. Um, <laughs> But uh, everything I'm going to tell you guys today is uh, there's a sort of a summary on that sheet. I won't promise that I'll follow that sheet, but it sort of gives you a guideline of what I'm going to do. And that sheet is posted on our blog here. Uh, and the link, I think, is at the top of that sheet, I hope. And it's best just to read it actually on the blog because all the really valuable links are going to be right here on the blog. So um, the first thing I want to say is that, yes, you can and should use YouTube in the classroom. Um, you can because it falls under fair use. Almost everything you would do with, with YouTube will fall under fair use. Um, and if you want to learn more about fair use, there's a couple of links here I've given you. There's actually a checklist that you can go check out. Uh, I think this is it here. And you can actually go right down it. If you're concerned about a certain um, piece of material, using it in class that might be uh, copyrighted or against um, not within the bounds of fair use. You can just look here, and you can see uh, factors that favor fair use. Well, teaching is the number one factor. And uh, as you go down through here, you'll find that being an educator, you're working for no money, and you're not trying to impinge on the market for this product. You generally are in the bounds of fair use. Even more fun, though, for us is that you can also download this stuff and manipulate it under the rules of fair use if it's for criticism or parody or for education or and if, especially for all three. If you're doing all three, then you're definitely good. Um, and this is just, you know, it, it helps us to maintain our rights of free speech. And when we misunderstand copyright, we're actually, you know, we're in danger there of losing 
some of our aspects of free speech. And YouTube is a great platform for us to get ideas out there. Uh, and using copyrighted material can be a great way to do that sometimes. So if you want to look more into that, you can look at this recent article called Recut, Reframe, Recycle. It was uh, featured in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, it's by a couple of American university professors, one in law and one in media studies. And they work together to sort of help all of us who don't have time to go through all the laws figure out what is fair use and what isn't. And so you can read that if you're interested. But I'll just guarantee you that almost everything you do, you can do. So uh, we'll, we'll move on from there. Why you should do it, I put down relevance, engagement, new media literacy. I can go on and on about all of that stuff. Um, if you want me to defend it later, I will. But let's get on with like how to actually do it first. Okay. So the first thing that we might want to look at is how to find them. I don't know if you guys realize this, but since I started talking, let's see, I've been, say I've been talking like for three minutes, about 10 hours of material has been added online, about 200 clips. Um, material is being added 200 times faster than you can view it. And if you could just stop it right now, it would still take you four lifetimes of watching material constantly in order to watch everything that's online. So the question is, like, how are you possibly going to find all this? And you can actually go to the front door of YouTube, which is interesting. You can, go to, like, you can click on the most recently added, and you'll just see a mishmash of stuff from all over the world. And what's interesting, you go back, I just said you know, 10 hours was added in the last uh, three minutes. Of those 10 hours, you know, there are 200 videos, and 182 of those, roughly, based on our research that we've done, is, uh, would be completely new and original. Nobody's ever seen that before. 182 videos in the last three minutes, nobody's ever seen before, and there they are. Um, and this is growing exponentially. So the first thing is, how do you find this stuff? And you might think you'd start with search, and search isn't a bad way to start, um, especially if you're willing to kind of think outside the box about what it is you want to bring into the classroom. Like if you're doing a lecture on, um, oh, let's see, I'm, I'll stick with anthropology here. And say you're doing a lecture on uh, like different aspects of different types of economies worldwide. Say you're comparing different types of economies. Looking up economy is not going to get you very far. <laughs> Looking up economies isn't going to get you very far. But you can sort of sidestep it and you can say, well, I want an example of how our commercial economy happens to be working right now. And I want to give an example of how like, um, the advertising agency works, or something like that, how ads work. And then you can look at it for an example of an advertisement that can give, that can give your uh, lecture a little, uh, you know, some, bring it, make it relevant, make it so that you get a good example. So what you're really looking for in videos are examples. You're not looking for the actual explanation. You're looking for like, things that sort of amplify what you're saying and give you examples. So, that's the way to go about a search. I'll just point out real quickly, when you do a search on YouTube, they have ways of, of, uh, of limiting the search through relevance, date added, view count, and so on. Just be aware of those things as you do the search. Now, if you want to go a little bit further, there are things called meta, meta searches, which basically search every video site on the web, so you don't have to go to YouTube and then Google and all that. It can actually take in all of them. Um, Mama is a pretty good one. It's just mama.com. We could do, I'm going to be, if you guys have probably seen the Dove campaign, the Dove commercial campaign. So I'm just going to put in Dove commercial here in Mama. And if it's connected, I'll show you what the results look like. It's grabbing results from about 200 different sites right now. Uh, and you can see over here, it actually sorts them. These are 293 from YouTube, 21 from Daily Motion, and then so on. So it's really just grabbing them from all over the place. If you're going to do a search, this is a great place to start with a search rather than kind of trying to go through all the different sites. Okay, so then the next thing, and I'm going to, I think searching is actually the worst way to find videos. Now we're going to go to some of the better ways. Um, watching the blogosphere is a great way to do that. And to watch the blogosphere, go to technorati.com. Tech, and if you think about what, what is the blogosphere, the blogosphere is roughly, you know, Seven months ago, they were saying it was 70 million people. I, I'm guessing there's possibly 100 million blogs now. And think of that, that's actually, and say like, let's just say 20% of those are actually active. That's 20 million people who are actually like scouring the web, finding interesting content, and writing about it. And so if you're interested in doing something, say on advertising, you could just do a search for advertising video. And anybody who's happened to blog about that in the last 24 hours, it will come up here. And you may actually find a video. You can also actually limit your search to videos. And these are all 
and here right at the top about sex, advertising, mind control, and psychology comes up right to the top. What's interesting about these is like people in the blogosphere, um, there's a lot of professors in the blogosphere for one thing, and they're all scouring the web trying to find material for their classes, and when they do, they often post it. And when you find those people and you find their blogs, go ahead and grab their RSS feed and add it to like some, you may use Google Reader or you may, this is NetVibes here, this is a little bit beyond what we're doing with the YouTube stuff, but um, if you're not familiar with RSS, click on the link that I provided in the, on my webpage, on the, and it's on there as well, but um, click on this link here that explains RSS, set up, where it says set up RSS feeds, and I use NetVibes, this is NetVibes right here, and what this does is it actually, the moment that, say, these are actually, you know, people who are doing similar things as me, and they're blogging. The moment somebody, um, like this is some research being done at Berkeley on YouTube, the moment they post something, it's going to show up right here. I mean, literally within seconds when they post it, it shows up here. And that's true for all of these. Each one of these represents somebody blogging about something, and it shows up on my page immediately. So I can wake up in the morning and say, like, oh, somebody found a cool video, and it's right there, and I'll just grab it, and I'm going to take that to class. So it's really about networking with a whole bunch of people around the world who have similar interests as you, and they're looking for videos just like you are. And as you build that community, it's not just you looking for videos. Suddenly, it's a whole bunch of people looking for those videos, and that really helps you locate the really good ones. So that's, what, that's the power of the blogosphere, and you can see how much more powerful that is than just searching. The next one is rankings, and there's a lot of good, yeah? Can you real quick, can you just say what RSS is? Yeah, I'll, okay. So RSS is, means really simple syndication, and <laughs> is one way to say it. Um, there's arguments about what it actually stands for. But if you look at my blog, for example, it says entries RSS, and you'll see a little orange thing a lot of times that will, it, it means like there's a feed there. All you have to do is uh, copy that. So I'm gonna copy that link location, and you go into NetVibes, or any feed reader, and it's, you'll have a thing that says add a feed, and that's, see the, these are the different emblems that you often see for those. And I'm just gonna paste that in there. I add the feed, and now it's gonna make a new box for my blog here. And you'll see that it, it's actually, it had been grabbed. I, I posted this about an hour before I came in here, presentation YouTube in on uh, for the classroom, and there it is, it's actually, and. In fact, people all over the world already have seen this. I've gotten three comments already since I've been talking here about this, <laughs> um, about this, this thing itself. So you see how we're all sort of connected in new ways, and, and, and there it is. So is that good enough for RSS? And, it's, um, and then uh, so here we are now at the rankings, and viral video chart is a good one because it actually separates the rankings. You know, the top 20 viral videos maybe are interesting because maybe there's going to be something in the top 20 that, you know, if it's up here, your students are watching it. And it may be something you want to comment on or something like that. Um, but there's also ones like there's ads. There's ones on animals. Uh, they, they have broken this down in many different ways. And so depending on what you teach, there may be something interesting here. You know, they've got a whole section on the election. And these are all clips you can just take with you right to class. And so depending on what you teach, there might be some section here that is worth looking at and keeping track of that top 20. Um, I'm not going to go into Google right now, but Google does have also a, and I've linked to it here, they also have rankings, and they're sortable, um, but in different ways. Instead of sortable by category, they're sortable by most viewed today, most viewed this week, and, and so on. So it's a different way of categorizing it. I think the viral video chart has been more effective for me for finding material, but the Google rankings can also be useful. Now, another really powerful tool is Dig, and let me see if I can get this. Uh, Dig is, can, is called a meme digger. Um, a meme is like a cultural idea that's sort of floating around, and, and a meme digger is something that finds those memes and aggregates them. So I'm going to show you what this looks like here. I'll show you how it, it's pretty apparent how this works once you see it. So what this is, is uh, there's a whole community of people on Dig, and they share things. So in fact, 
I don't have it here, but um, there's, you can put a little button in your browser, and when you see something you like, you can say that you dig it, and that means it'll post here once you dig it, right? Well, then everybody else sees it, and then you can say, I can go down through here, and I see this iPhone guitar, and I think, oh, that's cool. I'm going to dig it, and that means I'm giving it a thumbs up, and it gets another point here, and it sort of rises up the charts as it gets more digs. And so the, the, this is actually organized, basically, um, these are, I don't know exactly what the algorithm is, but roughly the people with the most digs in the last hour. So this is, these are the hottest videos of the moment. You can do it by the last 24 hours, by the last seven days, 30 days, or past year. And the best part is you can organize these, and they even have a science section. So if you're into, you know, if you want to see what the hottest videos in science are right now, you can do that. And here's one on change blindness. It would be great for psychology or something like that. And so there's all sorts of great uh, clips here, applicable to all kinds of different classes. And you can find that this is another great way to find them, uh, is through DIG. So you can also, you know, not surprisingly, there is an RSS feed here. So you could also grab that. If, once you find the categories that seem to be feeding you the right kind of videos, you can grab that RSS feed and put it onto your NetVibes or onto your whatever RSS reader you're using. So again, yeah. Show me again. Why, where's the RSS feed? Well, here's one up here. See the little orange thing? And I've never tried this one. Um, so I'm going to copy the link location. I'm going to go back to my NetVibes. NetVibes is just netvibes.com. You have to sign in and create an account. And it basically becomes your own little um, sort of home on the web. And I'm going to paste this in here. And this should be like a sciences video feed, or at least a science feed. And that it's I actually you'd have to go find the actual video feed. I've actually just grabbed the full science feed. So this is about anything that's interesting to the dig audience uh, in science will show up here. And uh, this can, you know, it's another, here's the invisibility, this is a video, and so on. So again, it's bringing the videos right into your, um, onto your sort of platform. I guess the, the key to me, for me, like the way I think about the information environment we live in today, is not an environment where you go out and find things, you set it up so the information finds you. And that's, that's the way to look at this. So this kind of just keeps track of your RSS. Yeah, yep. And what I've done actually with this, there's different ways to set this up. Um, NetVibes, this is a sort of a prototype of the next NetVibes. Um, this current NetVibes is like your own home space. But the neat thing about the next NetVibes is that you can invite other people to view your own page. And so I've been using this, for example, for my intro class. And this becomes like a platform where they can share materials and, and RSS feeds and so on. So. Um, so any other questions about that? OK. So we're through the meme diggers like Dig. Then there's a whole bunch of specialty sites that have emerged lately. And these are specifically trying to fill the void of YouTube seeming like it's, it's not quite the level of scholarship that we want. And so we have a number of sites like uh, Big Think, which is um, basically all geared around sort of high-level conversation. They just invite um, great thinkers and sometimes just really popular people to come give their ideas about some subject. And these, are, these can be great you know, conversation starters for a class. And again, like they're on all different topics. And so that's a, that's a good one. Uh, another one is Fora TV, which um, grabs uh, basically it t tends to be like anything going on in the world um, you know, that has to do, like here they say, the Brilliant Ideas Network for Video Discourse and Debate. And really like important events are often hosted here. Um, I'm guessing that there will be video from the World Economic Forum, for example, will show up here. And the nice thing here is that you can download all of this stuff. Most of the stuff that goes up here, you can download. So if you don't have a connection wherever you're doing your presentation, you'll be able to just download it. Um, and this is a really great platform as well. Then SciV is another one. And SciV basically directly went after the science commu community. 
And the idea of Sci-B is that when somebody releases a scientific paper, they want that, those scientists to also release a video that sort of summarizes their findings and, and can sort of uh, augment what they've written on paper. So Sci-B has been, uh, it's been really successful so far. And again, you see these RSS feeds, right? So as soon as you find one, grab it and go put it back on your NetVibes. And eventually what you've built is this place where all the stuff is coming to you. So uh, let's see, I think that covers most of the... Oh, and here's another one that's really good. If you're teaching uh, history or social sciences of some sort, it may be surprising, but there's a lot of really great K through 12 resources. And because it's just media, these are K through 12 people grabbing media clips. And of course, they're going to be analyzed on a different level in the K through 12 environment than in the university environment, but they're the same clips. And uh, this is a great project up at Ithaca College where they've grabbed a lot of stuff for a K through 12 curriculum, but it turns out that these videos are great for, um, for the university as well. And you'll have to kind of click through to find some of the stuff, but um, But there, it, in the midst of all this, there are various um, QuickTime videos. Like here's a clip from Aladdin. And you would think, well, why am I going to show a clip from Aladdin? But if you've ever watched Aladdin carefully with a critical eye, you'll see all sorts of stereotypes being played out through it. And again, like that's a great way to start a conversation, right? And again, why can they do this? Why can they host a Disney movie on their website? They can do it because it's fair use, because it's being used for criticism and education. So um, you just never know where you'll find great clips, but that's another one there. Uh, so those are the four specialty sites I was highlighting. If you have any more, feel free to add in the comment section of this blog, and we might be able to create quite a uh, collection here. The next one I want to talk about is the next way of finding videos is called stumble video. This is a great thing to do while you're eating lunch or just killing time. Has anybody ever used Stumble Video before? Okay, so Stumble Video, you log in, and then you just like hit Stumble, and it takes you to something it thinks you're going to like. Well, I, I teach religion and culture, so it actually thought I might like this video, and that's pretty impressive, right? Like I clicked once, it just went out into the into the vast world of video and thought, you know, I bet you're going to like this video, and yeah, I think I do. So I'm going to say I like it. And now it's comparing me with all these other people who are giving thumbs up and thumbs down. It's almost, it's a form of artificial intelligence in a way. And it's comparing me with all these other people and saying, well, other people who liked this also liked this. And this is a funny one. Oh, yeah, this is funny. This is that guy with the flip chart. And I think that's funny, so I like it too. <laughs> and this is the guy from Comedy Central. I forget his name, but he's funny, so I give him a thumbs up. Um, Here's a Michael Jordan mixtape. I have no idea what this is. I may not like it, right? So I'm going to hit don't like it, and then I hit it again. And it's constantly comparing me against this vast database of users who have likes and dislikes and is, is sort of saying, you know, you're probably going to like this. You know, I think I've given a few thumbs up for sports stuff in the past and Michael Jordan stuff in the past, so it thinks I'm going to like this. So, and, and so on. You can just keep on stumbling and stumbling and go on and on and on, and it finds things that it thinks you're going to like. And you'll be amazed. I'm to the point now, I've, I've rated over a thousand movies on here, a thousand videos, and it's, it's my research, so don't think I'm just killing time. <laughs> but uh, I've watched over a thousand videos on here, and now, like, I, I also, you know, I have this six-month-old son, so in the middle of the night, crying baby, I'll just sit there, like, shaking him and helping him out, watching these videos, and I'll get 20 in a row that I love. I mean, and just like better than TV, way better than TV. And so Stumble is a really great thing like that. How, how does it know that you, uh, like uh, your research is religion and, and uh, culture? It doesn't, but I've, as I've been watching videos, every time a religion one came up, I've given it a thumbs up because I you know, found it useful for my class. And then it keeps finding more. Yeah. Um, with Pandora, similar process yeah. for music, but it gives you, you can create separate channels. Can you do something like that? Yeah. Yep. So there are channels over here, and you can actually select. And you can also, when you sign up for StumbleUpon, it'll ask you about your interests. So you can click, like, anthropology. I mean, it goes deep, lots of channels. I mean, anthropology is there, um, you know, religion, and so on. And these are all the ones, I think, that I've actually selected. 
So, any other questions about that? Yeah. Are these downloadable? Well, this is trickier. I'm going to show you how they're downloadable. They are. Everything's downloadable. <laughs> you just <laughs> so you can go back and find. Yeah. Okay, I like these it actually you kind of keeps track of this stuff for you. You can go to your home page, and it'll show you like the things that you've given a thumbs up to. Um, and then what you can do is you can go to the actual URL um, for the YouTube video, and then you can download it from YouTube. So that's, that's the way you would do that. Any other questions about that? All right, so that's uh, stumble upon. Now, one of my favorite ways of finding good video, though, is actually using social tagging. Um, and one of my favorite social tagging sites is Digo, and I'll show you how this works. So what you're looking at here is this is from an intercession class I taught in, the, in May. So there's 35 students in this class, and it's only three weeks long. And during that time, just any time, we, we all got set up with Digo. And what Digo is, is say I'm somewhere on the web, and I've got this Digo toolbar installed. I'm, say I'm at this site called Zamzar, and I think, oh, this is useful. I'm going to bookmark this. And it's not, the interesting thing about this is it's not bookmarking just to me. It's bookmarking, I can bookmark it to my entire group. I can bookmark it to the world. I can bookmark it at any level. And in this case, I'm going to share it to the digital ethnography class because this is a good converter. It's an FLV converter, so I'm just going to tag it with these things. And now, whenever one of my students who's in digital ethnography is looking for an FLV converter, they can, they'll find it uh, through this link here. So I've submit this and close it. And it'll take a while, but just to give you a sense of how this works, it takes about three minutes for this to come up. But um, here, this is the tags that we are, or the sites that we are sharing. By the end of this talk, that Zamzar will show up here on the top of the list. And you can see just 11 minutes ago, one of my students uh, tagged this about uh, J uh, Japan's cell phone culture. So, yeah. Does it work much the way that Delicious does? It's exactly the same as Delicious. Um, so if you're familiar with Delicious, it's that, except it goes many steps beyond that in that you can also, uh, I'll try to give you an example here. You can actually highlight things, and you can add sticky notes, and these can like show up for other people, like your students can see these things. So you can have an assigned reading, and you can actually put sticky notes in there, and students could add their own sticky notes, and they can have conversations right there on the page. So that's what makes Digo just sort of a step beyond. Yeah? Does that work on Flash content websites or only on HTML? Uh, it works on, the new version works on Flash. It will, because it'll just uh, create a anchor. It's hard to ex explain exactly. Like, I'll, I think this will work here. There. See how it just created an anchor there? And that'll work on any Flash site as well, I think. <laughs> so, OK, so that's how. Uh, so just to give you an example now, so these are the 32, looks like there were 32 videos that my students tagged during that time. And these are all tagged, you know, I, I tagged one of them here, but, you know, these are all students who are tagging these things. And then I can look at them and say, well, my students thought this was relevant. Maybe I should show this in class, you know. And, and so that's another way is just leverage your students because your students are watching videos all the time. And, uh, you know, that can be really useful. So... That's another great way. And then finally, I also want to mention that our library has a great library of DVD and VHS content. Um, I'm not a fan of showing whole DVDs in the, class, in the classroom. So librarians might get mad at me for this next statement. But <laughs> under fair use, it's my understanding <laughs> that, that you can take these, uh, take these DVDs and hack them, basically. I'll show you how to hack them in a second. And, and you can copy them, and then you can actually, what, what I do is I take a 50-minute DVD, and I'll boil it down to like a two-minute clip, and maybe a series of two-minute clips that are peppered throughout my lecture. And that way, you don't lose that connection with the students. You know, when you go in to show a video, what happens? Like, all the students sort of sit back, you know? And like, you're, it's over. <laughs> you know, class is over. Instead, just show them like a two-minute clip, and it's actually the opposite. You know, it, it keeps, keeps them engaged and so on. 
So I'm all about two-minute clips. I have, personally, I have just over 3,000 two-minute clips now over the past four years that I've gathered that I just throw in at different times. And just starting up your collection is, can be really valuable for that. So um, just briefly, I'll tell you guys how to get this stuff. There's two ways to copy a DVD. One is to get equipment that is old enough that the macrovision uh, protection is not built into the equipment yet. So if look on eBay, and there's a thing called Dazzle DVC 50 is my favorite one. Um, that will import anything, any analog content. Also, the new iRecord, if you guys have seen this iRecord thing that can be used for podcasting, it records directly in the iPod format. And somehow the first edition of this got through without the macrovision protection on it. So that's another great way to do it. Those are about $200. The Dazzle is only like 5 bucks, but if they're hard to find. You can find them at garage sales sometimes. And then um, the other way is just to get the DVD decryptor, which is software. And it will actually, you put the DVD into your drive, and it will decrypt the DVD, allow you to copy it to your hard drive. And it goes in as VOB files. But then you can convert those VOB files. And I've included a little note about how to do that. You can convert it with this thing called Super, which is downloadable here, and it's free. All this stuff is free. And you can convert that to any file format you want, and then you can manipulate it. And, and that's some of the great content that you see on YouTube, where people have taken copyrighted content and made a parody. Or anybody, The most popular video of the week this week is Hitler complaining about the Cowboys. Has anybody seen this? So they took like a German movie with Hitler getting irate you know, um, because the war's over and so on. But what it's really about, is, uh, what they, they subtitled it with like, oh, those, you know, effing cowboys, they lost again, like all this stuff. And this has like gotten 300,000 views in the last couple days. So, um, and that somebody out there got DVD decryptor and, you know, and like, you know, basically got this DVD and then you can like make these videos. Um, I don't know where the library would stand on this. I know there's librarians out here. <laughs> but but um, my, what I've been doing is I, I go to the library and I get these materials, which we've paid for. We've paid a university license to show this material. So I, therefore, I feel it's OK. If I wanted to show a clip, I'm just making it easier so I don't have to like go in class, put a DVD in, go find it. I can just put it in and, find, and just zip right to it. So I think in the interest of better education, it seems to outweigh any sort of possible copyright infringement. Um, so that's the DVD decryptor stuff. Now, uh, as far as downloading these things, because a lot of you may go into classrooms that have an unreliable connection, possibly no connection at all. So there's a couple ways to do this. There is zamzar.com, which I just showed you. So I can go find that again. And what you can do here is there's actually a link here. This is the easiest way to do this. Uh, you have to put up with advertising for these free things. <laughs> but um, all you do is you put in the link for the YouTube video, so whatever, or, and it works with other sites as well. Not all sites, but certainly works with YouTube. And about 65% of videos are on YouTube. So let's just say we want to do this one. This is the famous Dove Evolution video. And actually, all I need is the link, so I'm just going to copy the link. And then we go over to Zamzar. And you just put in the link here. And then you convert the file. And you just want to convert it to something that you can use. So MP4 is basically like the iPod format. MOV is a, probably the most universal format in it. Virtually any computer can play that. So we'll do that. Then you put in your email. I'm not going to do it right now, but then you hit convert, and it'll take it can take like a half hour for this to go through the whole process, and then it sends you an email with the file. That's the way Zamzar works. There's also another one called Vixie.net, which I've also linked on the blog and mentioned in that bit there. And you can on this one, it'll actually give you the download link right here on the page. So if you don't want to wait for the email, uh, this way works as well. Um, so then you have a file that you can actually take with you and show in class. Now, if you're going to do sometimes, I'll give you two caveats to that. Sometimes those things don't work. 
uh, and I'm not, I haven't quite figured out the logic as to why it works on some videos and not on others. But sort of the foolproof way to, for these things to work is to get this program called Download Helper. And what down, this will also give you a better quality video. So if you're going to edit this video and sort of make a mashup of some sort, you can get this thing called Video Download Helper. It's a Firefox plugin, so you have to be using Firefox. And when it installs, it, in, it creates this little button up here. Now watch this button when we go back over here to YouTube and we'll load this up and you see that that button came to life just now because it found a video that I might want to download and there it is. And if I click on this, it will start, it'll allow me to download that. But you can see it's downloading as an FLV file, which is a flash video file. Flash video files will play on some players and I I think I made a link. There's one called the Wimpy FLV player, which is a pretty good one. So, but the problem is that Wimpy FLV player might not be installed on a campus computer where you're going to go do your presentation. So you may want to convert it to a WMV or an MOV, something that you know will play on any computer. And so that's when you need the super encoder. And I've put a link here to the super encoder. And the super encoder will trans basically convert an FLV file to a MOV or WMV file. And it's a, it's a little bit complex to use. Um, so I would recommend, unless you're going to re really be doing a lot of editing and you need really high quality videos, I would recommend that you just stick with Bixi or, or the Zamzar. But if you want to take it in the next level and, and really like start to edit these videos, then you might want a really high quality base to work with. And in that case, uh, you're going to want to do this video downloader and then convert it with super. Yeah. Are both those other sites free? I saw that you had login information in the upper right, so you've actually subscribed to those sites. Uh, let's see, which one? Zamzar. Zamzar. They are free. Are there different levels though? Yeah, they, there are different levels. We talked about levels. something with pricing. Yeah, so Zamzar, um, the different levels are basically, well here's the pricing and setup. Um, you can see it's, it's free. Unless you're going to store your videos online, you really don't need to go do anything. Like these are $7 a month and on up. They just give you higher priority, so you'll probably get your videos faster if you pay. But I've never paid and I've never had a problem with the videos. So, um, And again, I would recommend sticking with Zamzar or Vixi if you're downloading stuff. Uh, even if you're doing editing, those are the easy way to go. But if you really want to do high-level editing, you want to do something like that, then you might want to go um, grab down, yeah, Download Helper and so on. So any questions about that part of it then, downloading them? Or any, anybody, anybody have any other ideas about how to download? Do you want to share? OK. All right, so then the next step then is, say you have downloaded them. And this is where this becomes like a cooking show like where I'm going to show you like this is what would have happened if you did download it and this is how you could remix it and all that type of stuff. So, um, so it's kind of fun to remix this stuff and there's, there are, most people are surprised at this but basically every computer in, you know, that you buy today has a free um, video editor in it. If it's a Mac it would be something like iMovie and if it's a PC you'll have Windows Movie Maker. And both of those things are just remarkably easy to learn. Um, I just I teach this digital ethnography class, and last week I had you know eight new students in this class. They'd never done any video editing ever, and they turned in their first video yesterday, four days after class started. So it was their first assignment. They had no tutorial from me, and that's sort of my policy. Is like I think they learn more if they just go figure it out, and. They all figured it out. They all came back with videos. And if, if I look back at last year, last year's class, we have it set up so they come in after the first week, they have to turn in a video. And then I give them a couple tutorials. And, and then three weeks into the class, they have to turn in a video that they think um, is something really high quality that they are really proud of. Last year, so this is three weeks. They start from nothing and in three weeks produce a video they're proud of. And in last year's class, uh, just as an example, one of the students 
Uh, produced a video is viewed by about 10,000 people and will be featured on the AT&T tech channel here in the next month. So like this is broadcast television, like sort of saying like, oh, this is good, we're going to feature this. And then um, another one actually got paid by Digo, that, which I just showed you guys, to create a promotion for their product. And if you go to the Digo homepage and you look at that video there, that was created by a student who came in with no, no training whatsoever and three weeks later, it produced a video which caught the eye of Digo, and Digo hired him to make this video. So that's how fast you can, the tools are really that easy, you know, and, and, and it's pretty remarkable how you can pick them up. It does take some, you have to go through some frustration, I'll guarantee you, <laughs> but, but it is possible. And, and, you know, just, you can just start by making simple slideshows or something for your family or something like that, just something real simple, and you can work your way up. Um, the way I did it, the way I started was by taking videos from the library and then compressing them down. And that's how I got my start, was just trying to find the right clips. And I learned how to do the basic like cutting and arranging of clips and so on. So I'm going to show you here. Um, I put here the remixing that you can use Windows Movie Maker or iMovie. Those are very simple. Basically, all video programs look the same. Uh, so whatever I show you here, you'll get a sense of how it looks. And I'm going to use Sony Vegas. This is Movie Studio. And this is only $45 or $50 for academics. So it's not even that expensive. And it gives you a lot more functionality than the baseline. It's better than iMovie, and it's better than Windows Movie Maker. So if you have $50 and you want to do this stuff, this is a great place to start. And what I've done here is I've downloaded um, a few clips from YouTube, and I've converted them. And they're all sitting here. And and this is very typical of a video editing screen. You'll have like one section is just the place where you get stuff. This is where you're going to get titles. It's where you're going to get your um, videos. It's where you're going to get your music. And then there's a thing up here. This is the timeline area. And that's where you're going to lay down your stuff. And you can remix it up there. And then this is your output screen over here. So just to give you an idea here, like I can just grab this video here. And I want to just put it up here on this track. And there it is. And I can delete it off that track, and it's gone. I'm going to, and you, so let me see if I can give an example. I'll do this on the fly here, see if this works. Do you have any sound? All right. So this is the Dove, like a famous Dove commercial here. And I can adjust the volume, it's easy enough to do. I can change the music. And let's see here, I'll, I'll give you a few other examples. I mean, I can just go on and on with all the things that can be done. Once you, um, once you grab a clip and you put it up here, here I put this clip up here just as an example. And you can move this clip around. And here's the most important piece here. Um, if you just want a little piece of this video, you can. I just put push S, and it made a split. And now I now I have this piece, and I can move it. And I can move it after things. Like this is, you know, how you can move things around and re recreate the video in some way. So here I've just reversed a couple events. And you can just go on and on. You can split the audio, you can take off the audio, and so on. All this can be done, and it's relatively, you can do it all relatively quickly and easily, and so on. Now, I'll show you the next. I'm going to delete all this. Now, this is, I made this video just to sort of make a point to my students, right? And I, I love the Dove campaign, and so I wanted to show them that. We were talking about beauty and beauty standards and where they come from and that kind of thing. And the Dove campaign is a great commentary on beauty standards in our culture. Um, well, then it turns out, though, that Dove is also owned by, uh, owned by Unilever, which, is, which also owns Axe. And so I created three different, um, I just created three pictures here. And this says Dove is a brand operated by Unilever. And I just imported these pictures into the video, so is Axe. And then I leave them with the question, so what are they really telling her? 
And then I've downloaded some Axe commercials. If you guys are familiar with Axe commercials, they're the ones like with, there's one called Billions, where the, and it has billions of, of like bikini wearing women rushing after this guy because he's so hot because he's wearing Axe. And <laughs> then there's, uh, and then there's one where these two girls are fighting over a guy. And, and if you read this message here, You know, this is what's the message here? Oh, hates her freckles and so on. Like, this is like, let's get real. Like, let's f see the beauty in all of us, right? But then the other message that they're sending from the same company is, you know, blondes are beautiful. You should have big boobs like this and so on, right? And so I just wanted to make that clear. And so I changed up the music a bit and added this video here. And it's sort of the cutting message underneath it. That And of course, this isn't the end, right? I mean, then this opens up the con. This, these are conversation starters. These aren't like ultimate statements of fact. These are what Marshall McLuhan called probes. You know, they just like bring out something in our culture and then let's discuss it. You know, so these are great ways to start discussions. So um, I'll show you a couple other examples of, of actually using these in the classroom. Are there any questions? Yeah. That's kind of an awkward question. Be able to over, like, YouTube videos oh yeah, stuff like that. yeah, like, like, yeah definitely. And it, that's you know there's something really cool out there, uh, a new program a friend, friend of mine started. He's getting a lot of good press for this. It's called dotsub.com, and it actually allows you to without even downloading YouTube videos or anything, you can uh, you can actually subtitle videos. And here's like. This is a video we did in our classroom. This is a uh, Bluemont 101, and you can see here this video has been translated. 87% of it has been translated into Arabic. Um, English has already, of course, has the subtitles. Uh, it's in French. 37% in Greek, and so on. So these, and all this is, is like show you how this works. It's very easy to add um, the subtitles, and it's in wiki format, so multiple people can can add subtitles from all over the world. So, uh, you know, like there's probably there may be several dozen people working on the Arabic translation, and they're all over the world. And as you play this, let's see, we'll go to the there's the Arabic translation. There's the Spanish, Italian. The Greek one isn't done yet, so. Here's the French. And so, yeah, so you can definitely subtitle. And it's getting easier and easier because these new tools are emerging all over the place. So, um, see any other questions at this point? Okay, so now I want to share with you guys the sort of, yeah. Yeah, so the good, very good question. So the, uh, the video I just showed you with the Dove Axe thing, I would, not be able to I would not be able to publish that. I never have published it because I used copyrighted music. But I could use uh, Creative Commons music, and there's a huge resource of Creative Commons music out there. It's called Jamendo, J-A-M-E-N-D-O.com. And if you ever want to make your own videos and you want good music to add on top, uh, go to Jamendo. And a lot of that music is 
licensed under Creative Commons, and there's many different types of Creative Commons licenses. Um, some of them say you can use this and sell it. Most of them say you can use this but don't sell it. And I often use those because I'm not planning on selling my work anyway. And there have been a couple cases where I made something and then later somebody wanted to pay me for it. And in that case, you just call the person who made the music and you say, what do you want to, do you want to do this? And we'll go 50-50 on, on it. And so we've, that's happened in the past as well. So, um, so you also, somebody called you and said, I want, I want to put an ad on the bottom of this. <laughs> You couldn't without the, without the consent of the Creative Commons music creator. Now, if you created your own music, then, then you could, but yeah. Yeah. I have a similar question about um, royalty-free images, for example, Getty images or something like that. Yeah. Is that the same fair use or, or called Creative Commons? So on Getty, there are royalty-free images. Is that, yeah. the, same, is that you, the same copyright law? I think if they're royalty-free, then you should be... Those, I, don't, I don't know exactly how that fits within. I think that's a different thing. Like if they're public domain and royalty free, then you're fine no matter what. Um, but I'm not sure. Does anybody know copyright law? Well, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not certain on that. But I'm guessing if they're royalty free, then you can use them in any way you want. So um, I wanted to mention a couple kind of tips for using them in the classroom. Um, Let's see, the first thing that I wanted to point out is just, and I've mentioned this before, but just use short clips. And I've, we've talked about, uh, I actually think two minutes, over two minutes is getting long. Um, and all you have to do is watch your students, and you might realize that. Um, it depends on what the clip is. I mean, students will watch you know, a two hour long movie if it's engaging enough, but, um, but two minutes is, tends to be pretty good. And the, the neat thing about keeping it two minutes is it keeps your voice in it and it keeps their voice in it. You can actually have like a really dynamic discussion just by showing a two minute clip and, and then you know like just stopping it after two minutes discussing then going back to it again or to a, the next two minute clip. So even a five minute clip, I'll usually break that down into two or three parts. And that way each idea has a forum, like it gets discussed and it gets analyzed and so on. Um, See, that's, that's the main tip on teaching. Then the other thing is, as far as getting students involved in these things, I'll give you one other example of how like, I've done this. This is a project we do in the intro class. And what we do is we, we do a huge final project. Um, it's called the World Simulation, and some of you may be familiar with this. And basically, we take over the ballroom, and we do this massive, we try to simulate the world with like 400 students. And the other thing that we do now, which is we just started doing it this past fall, is that we actually have 20 students with cameras. And they go around and they record the simulation. And then, of course, I can't look at, this takes two hours. So that would be you know, 20 students. That would be 40 hours of material to look at, which is way more than I could ever have time to look at at the end of the semester. So what I, I actually assign the students to take their two hours and, com and find the best clips and bring it down to like 10 minutes. So then I get 20 10-minute clips, and I watch those. And then I can edit it into this. And this then we can all watch this together, and we get a sense of like how this all you know, played out. And the, uh, what's going to happen with Chinchilla Nation today? You can also get a sense here of how complex a video project can get. You know, once you start, you know, when you really get adding some material here. You know, this is like 20 minutes long and a lot of work. <laughs> so you're really getting yourself into a lot. And these are all just clips of students. And then they come together, though, to create basically a, essentially a world history video. And we tie in all sorts of aspects of real life. I, I actually use clips from documentaries in here. And this is never, this stuff is never published, so um, that's, you know, if I tried to publish this, I'd have to get permission from the people that made these documentaries and so on. But I'll try to get an example of this. What about 
about the students in the video if you were going to publish that? Yeah, so I get course release, or I get um, appearance releases from all of them. And that's another thing you would need to work with if you're going to film students is just to make sure you get releases for them. And in some cases, IRB is appropriate. If it's actual research you're doing, then, you know, if you're doing a survey, like, you know, you have to go through IRB to get that kind of permission. So, all right, so I think I've taken you through the basics of all this. Is, have you, are you guys left with any questions now about how to do any of this? Yeah. Can you show real quick how you can transition between clips and audio and all that kind of stuff? I, on the, yeah, okay. So you want to just know, like, if I want to make take one clip and put it in front of another and then... Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll, so there's two ways to do that. In Windows Movie Maker, if you're using the free software, there's actually a section where you're, like, manipulating the clips that looks a lot like this, the timeline. And then there's another thing called transitions, and this one actually has some transitions. And you can choose all these different types of transitions. There's fancy ones. There's, you can make it spin, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. And in that case, you just drag it up here, and you add it onto the timeline, and it's there now. So that's that type of transition. But if you just want a real simple transition, I'll make one right here. All you have to do is drag this across, and it's actually making a fade transition right there. So it should fade now. You saw the fade then between the two. So that's how that works. So this is that's an important question because essentially when you start working with video, you have to start thinking in terms of layers. And, and it's all about layers. And so what you need is a layer on top of the video that's text. And so on top of the video then is this track up here. There's these multiple tracks. And this one is actually called text. You don't have you can rename that if you wanted to, if you're putting something else up here. But that's the text then shows up. My text is the blondes are beautiful one. <laughs> um, and uh, in this case, the way you do that is you just go grab text like this, and you can put it up on top of here. And I'll just point out a difference here. Like this is a solid background. This one, when it's checkerboard, that means it's a transparent background. So you can see through. And then you draw those lines or fade it. Like on those other ones, you have peaks and valleys. Oh, yeah. That's your own. You mean right here? Like this? Yeah. Well, yeah. No, the lines actually actually in the clip. These? You see the lines in the clips that are going up and down. Like these right here? The blue lines? Yeah, what are those? Two? Those are fades in and out, yeah. So, yeah, the way you can do that, I'll just take this one as an example. This is our clip. You can actually fade it. You can adjust how long it takes to fade and so on. Now, this is all stuff you cannot do in the free programs. It, this is what you're paying $45 for, <laughs> is to, to get that kind of control. This is Mac PC. This is PC. Um, the Mac, the uh, basic thing here is Macs are easy, to, like they're easier, to, the free stuff is easier on Macs and more powerful. But as far as the pay stuff, this really matches Final Cut Pro, and it's like 45 bucks. Final Cut Pro is much more expensive. So it just depends on what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. What do you recommend for a first assignment? For a first assignment for students to do? To actually make a video? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well. What I, I don't know, I'm conflicted about this. There's, I don't know, in some ways you just like tell them to go make a video they really want to make. And then if they really want to make it, they just make it happen. And you know, you hope for the best. Um, and what I normally do is I assign it due on say Tuesday. And then it's, oh, oh, 30 seconds. Like just, their first project, just make it 
yeah, just make it like, just have them show you that they can put a video up here and a different audio track down here. Like what I, like I, what I grade my first assignment on is can you show me that you can position two clips differently than they used to be? So that tells me that you can make a split and rearrange clips. And then can you put a different audio track on it? And that tells me that you know how to separate audio and video and create a new one. Then the second assignment, I have them add, you know, like a text. And the third assignment, I have them add like really complex layers and things. But, so. Any other questions on that? Yeah. Is there software like this available on the library computers? Yeah, this exact program is on the library computers. This is Vegas Movie Studio, and it's on the library computers. Um, the library has lots of great software in there, but they're only on the Media Center computers. They're not out in the commons. And I think they have four, four working PCs right now, and six total. <laughs> and then they also have a couple Macs. And, and the, again, the Macs are great for video editing as well. It's just um, this is a little bit easier than Final Cut, and I find it a little bit better for my purposes, at least. But I'm sure a Mac fan would argue with me on that. <laughs> any other questions about any of this? Yeah? What kind of cameras are they using? Oh, in my class there? Uh -huh. They actually, I have them use whatever camera they have, because 20 cameras are hard to find. There are a bunch of cameras at the library that can be checked out. But I, I even had students using digital cameras with, that have a video. Yeah capability, which is really bad video quality, but it's more about the activity and, and you know, what goes on than about the video quality, so it, it was fine. So. And I'll just make one comment here. The lately HD video is coming into play, and what that means, there's a couple expenses involved in that. Um, HD video, if you get an HD video camera, a lot of times you can switch it between DV and HDV. If you use the HDV setting, which is awesome because it has great quality, you do need the platinum edition of this, which will add like $40 <laughs> to your price. Um, and that's the only way you can capture HD video is with a special codec, and it's really expensive. So there's going to be a premium on any program you buy because they have to include that, that decoder basically inside it. And just so you know, if you are going to be capturing video from a, you just go up here and you hit capture video, and then it'll take you to a screen. And if I had a video camera connected, which I don't, it says I don't. Um, anyway, then it, your image would show up here, and you can actually control your camera here, and you just record onto your hard drive, and then you can manipulate the uh, file from there. So a couple of final things. Most common mistakes. Um, the most common mistake is that you save, you save the project. So you go to Save As and you save this project. But then you don't render the movie. So there's two different things going on here. Saving the project saves all of this information about how these clips are arranged. Rendering the movie actually sort of compresses all these onto one track and into one final movie that you can take the class and show to class. So there's two different things you need to do. Save your project often, and then when you're done, you render it, which means sometimes this is called make a movie. Like That's sort of like the layman's terms. Render as means make a movie. Um, so rendering is making a movie. And I think that is probably the most frustrating thing for people <laughs> when they finish a project and then they show up and they're like, they don't actually have the video because it's saved as a project, not as a video. And I think. That's all I have. Is there any other final questions? All right. Well. How large are these files? Oh, that's they're big. Put them on a CD or what? How long? What do you put them on? Um, the I the web or? I just have a whole bunch of these things, and <laughs> like I carry them with me everywhere. So, if you you know just pick up a gigabyte or two gigabytes, now they have four and eight gigabytes, but. Um, that should be plenty. When you, when you render these things, there is a trick here. Um, there's different levels you can render it as. You can render it as, a, as an uncompressed video, which 20 minutes of video 
would take out much, much more than this could ever do if it's uncompressed. So you want to compress it, and I usually just use the three megabits per second setting. And for every five minutes, you're getting about 100 megabytes. You could limit that down to one megabits per second, and you probably won't even notice the difference in quality, but you'll get about 15 minutes uh, per 100 megabytes. But once you go below one, you'll start to notice a drop in quality. So I would stay at one or above. Most of the videos you see on YouTube are at one megabits per second and then converted into YouTube format. No, it, it'll change. Is that where you're saving the size? Yeah. So 3 megabits per second actually gives you a 640 by 480 size. So, any other questions? All right. Yeah. Yeah, I put a link to this as well. So um, save it as a WMV, and it'll work in PowerPoint. Save it as an MOV, it'll work in Keynote. And at there may, it may even work. I don't use PowerPoint, so um, there may be other ways it'll work, but yeah. All right. So if you have any other questions, you can see me after the session, and thanks for coming.